Hi, I'm Avon Waters, and this week we're going to work on color theory and color relationships. I took a painting from beginning to the block in stage and wash with just a family of colors in a previous episode. This week I'm going to start that painting from where we finished in the beginning stages and work through the middle stages to show you how we can keep the colors balanced and how the beginning stages change and we add more detail. So let's get to it. Okay, this piece was uh, started in the previous video. And this episode, I'm going to take it from the blocking in stage and start establishing some additional colors. As you can see, because of my source, I made changes, as I said in the last video, but I wanted to add a few trees between this line of trees that would be in the foreground and the line of uh, trees off in the distance. So I needed something because of this big open spaces in here and so I'm uh, kind of blocking in some of these trees that are um, going to be in this middle, uh, middle ground. My part of the country has trees set in fence rows and in lines and I love that challenge. I call them uh, tree screens and these tree screens block out uh, a portion of what you see in the vista and that's just the way the farm fields and things in a flat area are and they normally say oh, there's this art rule that says don't put your trees in a line well nature and the farmers put all of our trees in the line and it's our job as artists in flatlands to figure out how to make creative use of straight lines. Wolf Kahn did it greatly. He would use his color harmonies to move the eye in little wedges of color very subtly, not giant triangles, but you would see a subtle movement through these uh, flat planes. He did a lot of flat plane area paintings with uh, tree screens and I've uh, accepted the challenge. They're very difficult to do. The sky has to come up over our heads and right now the way when you block it in with just a limited palette, when you block it in with just a limited number of palettes, uh, colors on your palette, the sky tends to go straight up from the horizon and not up over our heads. So we solve that by putting a little bit more intense color that we can gray down in what would be up over our head. If you've ever seen those photographs where the, the camera turns the sky a deep, deep royal blue overhead? That's the same sort of principle we're using here. We want the distance to go off and to fade away and the colors there will uh, be much more washed out because there's much more air between us and the horizon. But by putting down a blue, since my color palette is going to have predominantly some yellows in it, that blue mixes with our, the blue mixes with our a uh, little deeper saturation of our yellow that will go up in there and it will start to bring the sky little by little to be coming over our heads and not straight up from the horizon. The more you work with these pastels uh, as beginners, the more you'll start to see what colors mix well with others and how you can mix right. Um, and get layers right on your canvas. I'm not too worried about the shape of the trees at this particular point. Uh, the, the interest in this uh, tree screen and my interest comes from the spaces, what we call negative space in art, those spaces in between uh, objects. That's the negative space. I like to say I try to paint the air around a subject and not the subject itself. And so by blurring the edges, I get a lot of that effect that I'm looking for. Going back in with a little more blue, and I just keep layering this in, and it will bring that sky eventually. We'll get some opacity of these colors because they're layered in with lighter colors over and the sky will come up over us as we desire. The textures on this U-Art 
because I used gesso in the underpainting, I get this nice rough texture that really helps me paint using the side of the pastel and create uh, different layers of color. All these different layers you're seeing I put on will start to peek through on some of the skips and jumps that my pastel is making as I paint with the side of it. I'm going to use some of these pastels that have a little bit of rose in them. To make this pastel it has it has a little red and a little violet in these roses. And then here are my kind of peachy colors that are going to work with the blues to create grays in the skies. I'm deciding I'm going to have a source of light behind this tree that is closest to us and these eventual trees that will be between this tree and the trees off in the distance. This rose color is a nice warm color, uh, as is the peachy yellow that's already in there. But I want to create just a subtle bit of a light source behind this tree that's not behind all these other trees. And I do that by, again, layering in colors. This piece is not going to be finished today, but you'll see how taking it from the blocking end stage we get to add more color, more layers, more interest. And if you're liking these videos and you're getting something from them, please hit the subscribe button. For you newbies to YouTube, subscribe doesn't mean every time I post a video you get a message. You have to hit the notification bell for that. But it will be easy to find later on when you come back to look for some art instruction. I'll be in your subscribe uh, video area and you can see what's new and if any of that is of interest to you also. So please hit that subscribe button. Now you can see that I've got a little bit more of a warm color behind this tree and again these other trees are going to come in here because it's a big open area that has very little interest otherwise. So I'm starting to build that sky. This part of the sky is starting to come up over us because of the blues I put in there and the more saturated yellows. When you look straight up, the atmosphere is thinner and therefore the colors are more pure than as you go off into the distance and through the particles in the air and the atmosphere. I'm picking up a pale yellow pastel now and that will brighten some of these areas up. I'm not going to press very hard. I just want to catch some of the top areas of this and take some of the pink out and add some of that yellow which is the opposite of our violets which are in other parts of this painting and sky. Don't want to work too long in one area because one area can't come along very fast in comparison to other areas. If you do that, if you do work in some of those areas too long and you get too finished of an area, what will happen is your picture won't have unity. So you want to have your paintings have unity by mixing in some colors and mixing in some interest the same as we started layering that sky, we're going to start to try to get some of that interest in some of these other areas. And also what happens is, if you finish an area, the principles of color theory, one of them is relativity. When one color is placed next to another color, then the relationship of that color with another color changes as other colors are introduced. So you're constantly balancing your, your values, your gray values, your uh, saturated values, and the different hues as they relate to one another. You saw how dark those trees were with blue-green. This uh, blue-violet is taming down some of that contrast that that green had now that I added that rose color into the sky. And we're going to start trying to build just a little more interest in some of this open space. The study I did 
did not have as much open space because it was only 8 by 8 inches. Because this is 24 by 24, I believe it is, then that big broad sky area just started to create too much, too much open space in relationship to the areas that were down in here, which will be a little bit more saturated color. So I had to figure out a way to do that, and I'm working from memory since my source did not have these trees. I do know how other wooded areas, because I do a lot of plein air, and I know how some of those wooded areas have different trees between me and the trees in the background. Those trees in the background are way too dark now. And again, because I'm working over the entire area before I finish an area, I will be able to adjust those. I've grabbed a gray violet that's very much lighter. And because I've lightened up those trees that are closest to us, and I've added trees that are in the middle, I have to create an area that is off in the distance that's much, much more faded away. This picture is becoming, going from a, because of the gesso darkened those colors I chose, it's going more from the center of your grayscale if you converted this into gray tones, it's going more towards the, um, the light end of the scale, especially as we go into the sky and the background. And again, I'm using the side of my pastel to create these line of trees. If you look off into the distance, you see those blurry trees at the horizon. There's not much detail in them. So that's what we're trying to do here. Now you notice how this side that I'm working on is much narrower than this side. Early in this video I said Wolf Khan did a lot of these things where there's a very subtle movement of the eye through with these little wedges of color that vary in size as it goes across horizontally across the image plane. And that's what's happening here. And if you look at his pictures, you'll see those subtle differences. If you look at the edges of Khan's pictures, you'll see that he moves the eye with the uh, technique of compositional technique of using the S curve and the Z shapes. We haven't gotten into, on my tutorial videos, haven't gotten into much composition. I do a whole workshop on composition and uh, as do many people and if you ever get a chance uh, to come to a live workshop or one of my online workshops that's um, that's a way you can pick up uh, the compositional aspect of your art as you develop. Now you notice how I put this violet color in the background how that color I added here those trees are coming forward now they just disappeared against that dark ugly green Remember I said you got to go through ugly to get to pretty first. I put a little more pressure on this because that was so dark, but when you look at trees off in the distance, you'll see little dark areas. So these little dark areas that sh still show through will inform how I treat a little bit of texture and undulation that we, our eye would see in a distant uh, row of trees. I'm going to add the color up into the sky. This is a nice violet, and violet is the opposite of yellow. And since we have some of those colors that possess the yellow, look what that's doing here. Hopefully there's enough definition in your TV screen and YouTube that you can see how that violet is going to join and harmonize with other parts where I've used this uh, violet color and the family of violets in other parts of this painting. And again, that's the key, is to always continue to work on the entire piece so the colors stay related. But that's just a beautiful gray when I just 
scumble over. I'm not pressing hard. I'm just letting this violet hit the top edges of some of that rough texture that we put on with the gesso. And it's taming down that yellow that was really, really saturated and probably just a little bit too saturated for this painting. And I'm coming into the edges of the trees to get my edges soft. When branches of trees hit us the sky, it's not, it's not a sharp edge. There are all these little subtle branches and limbs that stick up into the sky. And if we try to paint each one of those things, it will drive us crazy. This is still a little green and a little bit too saturated in yellow. And I think I need to um, add a little bit more of a yellow color over that green to get... It's a little acidy. Some of my paintings I actually call uh, acid... Uh, I use the word acrid and acid. In my part of the country there's a lot of humidity and in August you would just feel like it's you're in a, bat, a vat of um, acid air and sometimes I'll use those colors in a painting but this particular painting is going more towards the violets and so that acid air is just a little out of place here. I've grabbed a little orange and orange has red in it and that acid air I was talking about has green in it and so the two should create or tone down that uh, greenish yellow green acid by using a little bit of orange over it and you can see that that area is, is now receding a little bit and not popping forward because of the saturation of that and it also because it goes a little bit on the uh, let's call it darker even even though the brightness is going down what it's also doing is it's a bringing out now again we're back to color theory and relationships it's bringing out this area of light that's going to be coming from behind that tree this effect of darkening the corners photographers called it probably artists do too call it vignetting um, old time photographs like from the 30s of starlets and things you would see the corners real dark and uh, look at some old um, uh, Hollywood promotion photos from the 20s and 30s they really vignetted in the corners and darkened them down and uh, when they get too dark it becomes what we call and this is a negative thing we call it the keyhole effect where you've just like got a keyhole an old skeleton keyhole in there and we want to avoid that in all of our paintings but we do want to darken the edges just a little bit more on our paintings on all four edges in order to draw the eye into the lighter parts but if you overdo it then it becomes obvious and you get a keyhole effect and we might be overdone at this particular point but again we're not near finished even off in the distance, the bases of our trees have, are a little darker because that canopy of green is going over it. And this is too dark, but it becomes something that allows me then to go over and get that blue, which is in our shadows, that uh, cooler colors that are in the shadows. I'm going to try to lighten this just a little bit and I'm going to try to get some of this lighter blue-green down to tone down that blue. And I'm thinking about how trees grow and especially along a wooded edge in this case, the edge of this field had a, a little uh, woods behind it. And in this particular case, those trees along the edge are always kind of like shrubs sticking up in front of the taller trees behind them. What happens is the farmers and the way land is developed 
is that they bulldoze a, a property line and then over time the big trees get bigger that were left in the, in the woods and the little trees send out rutlets and you get these shrubs along the front edge of these trees off into a distance. So they will catch a little more light on their tops and have green. But because this tree line's in the distance, that green becomes more of a blue-green or a violet-green. Now you can see, because we've worked our way down here, this is way out of proportion to this. We still want to use greens, we want to use some oranges and yellows, but we have to get them in relationship uh, into to be able to fit into this overall. Otherwise I have a, a foreground that is one painting, a middle ground that's another painting, and a sky that's another painting, and it's like we glued all three layers together. So we have to keep developing this painting as we go into its middle stages. As the colors get closer to us, the more, the more saturated they become. And you can see this violet is so much more saturated than the violets that were in other parts of this painting. And that's because they're closer to us. The particles in the air, again I'm painting the air, the particles in the air are making these appear to be a little bit brighter in whatever color and in this case we chose a color palette that was not realistic. We chose a set of analogous colors in the violets and the blues and decided we were going to use some of the some of the uh, complements of those colors. So as you can see those will against that background that we started with those distant trees we can start refining some of these shapes a little bit I'm not worried about the final shape at this point I'm just trying to get them in there and one thing I have a habit of doing you notice how I'm making this one just a little crooked I have a habit of making my trees just too perfectly vertical well in reality a lot of them are because what happens here where I live is as those trees are allowed to grow up in a in a field or a fence row or the edge of a woods they are really uh, striving to get up over the canopies of the trees around them and they do grow pretty straight but it becomes kind of monotonous so I intentionally need to vary those things just a little bit just out of my habit of making them too perfect and while sometimes I can make them succeed other times they just become just too perfect and objectionable now these trees that are closest to us you notice I'm putting that violet or purple in there that um, is also going down into the foreground as opposed to these trees that are in the middle ground. Uh, I'm doing that just simply as a background color to the future colors that I will add to it. They will become more realistic as we work towards the finish on this. So I went from an open field to a group of a grouping of trees that uh, is uh, through maybe something that was a field that has become overgrown more than what it was when we started from our uh, study, which the study was more closer to real life than what the painting is. I'm letting the painting at this particular point, I have not looked at my reference for a long time because I'm trying to let the painting tell me where it wants to go. Now just by adding this brighter green down in here, it's way too bright, but you can see how this particular green is getting me closer to the relationships as far as the value hues. Remember this green was added and gesso added to it and it darkened it by about two values. 
So we're trying to lighten up that aspect of this painting. And I'm not afraid to put in bright colors because I know I can change the relationship on these things. Like this is way too bright of a blue, uh, but I know that it's going to mix with that green, create some blue-green shadows in an area that I want to be darker in relationship to the other parts of this painting, just like the dark green with the gesso was darker. We want to create some areas that are going to darken up, but we have to get some base color underneath them. Uh, and since shadows, we're dealing with warm highlights and cool shadows, we're wanting to create some of that background blueness that eventually will peek through as we add more layers to this area just as we did to the other areas. Now I've gotten a, uh, a little uh, less bright of a blue. It's got a little green in it. And wherever there's some grasses and we put that bright green, look how that's dulling down that. Yet we're starting to get some relationship between some of these other colors that are up in here. And I can start to add some of these layered areas in the trees closest to us with this blue green because it's bright enough it's down in it's going to be down in some of these areas that the sunlight's hitting and it will create some interest here too and start to break up these large masses that don't yet have any definition you know our mind tells us that yeah that's a tree but there's not enough not enough details there yet in that tree to be convincing and I never like to add a lot of detail to my atmospheric paintings except for where there's going to be a sharp edge and usually that sharp edge is going to be used to create a center of interest not create a realistic branch hanging down just because there's a this tree has some branches hanging down we have to intrude some of these branches into the, because they're closest, closer to us, we have to intrude and cover up the, the tree a little bit. And we have to intrude into the middle ground, background, with some branches. You didn't see that in the underpainting, because I knew I had to add that later. Now these aren't near dark enough, because as the light falls on the tree, the tops of these branches will catch some light, but underneath it's much darker because this is a shadow area. And again, I'm going from my knowledge of working in plein air, knowing how branches and things work. So you don't have that knowledge if you're a beginner. Uh, and until you go out in plein air or you collect enough photographs, I recommend you look at other people's paintings for trees that are in whatever particular part of the painting you're looking at. Look at other people's paintings and see how they handle um, trees and branches. One of my videos talks about the best way to learn is to copy. So copying some of that into your work will be uh, a way for you to learn how to handle that until you get out and you decide Am I going to do plein air and, and learn some of these things so I can go back and reproduce them from memory? Memory paintings are terrific ways to paint because it makes you remember what you saw. You're not a slave to what you saw. A lot of plein air painters, they do a terrific job of recording the light and the colors, the local real true colors where that's not an interest of me. I like to pick a palette and work with color harmonies and that makes plein air painting for me is a way to practice seeing so that when I get in a situation like this I can remember what I saw and apply it to a painting that I'm working on as the painting tells me what it wants to do and where it wants to go. 
we have a lot of color balance to, balancing to do, but we've covered all that initial. We've spent the, all this time just covering the initial part of the um, underpainting and trying to start to establish some colors with our color palette that we selected in the very beginning. I had put in, off in the distance you see some trees at the edge of some of these woodlands and I had put in some scratches in the last uh, episode where I blocked this thing in and those scratches are still there and now I can come back and I can follow some of those lines where tree trunks off in the distance again they're not straight they're crooked at all different angles and I'm just going to add some of those before I quit for the day on this particular step of this painting but you can see that eventually we can get some of those uh, that interest in that open area in the back by adding where I scraped away things. There's still a lot of work to be done in here and the entire piece but you can see that we take it from a wash, the gesso, the wet techniques of using gesso to mush around the base colors that we put in from the color family we selected on the color wheel that those base colors get mushed around and they darken by a couple values so it's a job to if you don't plan ahead and use a couple lighter values then uh, I wanted this to be in the lighter end of the scale of grays when you photograph this it should photograph it um, in uh, the areas that are at the light end of the scale but the gesso made it go to the middle to dark end of the scale so I am working my way back towards the lighter end and those darks get to show through and they will inform some of those little specks of, of shadow that we expect to see that leaves create and that grass growing up into clumps create all these little dark areas we get to use as we go forward. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and tell your friends, your artist friends, uh, but please come back and check out uh, other tutorials. I'll uh, probably finish this. I may film it, may not, but uh, I will definitely keep working and uh, teaching you about values and color relationships and color theory. So until next time, Thanks a lot for watching, and um, we'll see you on the other side of the palette.